Okay, so welcome everyone. My name is Lisa Molson. I'm a librarian with San Jose Public Library. Thank you for joining us. Today, we are excited to present our um, water conservation in the vegetable garden with Valley Water. Before we get started again, just wanted to remind you it is being recorded to post on our YouTube channel at a later date and um, videos are turned off. I also want to mention that uh, the rebates discussed in this present presentation will apply to Santa Clara County Val uh, Valley. So if you're in Sacramento County, unfortunately that would not apply, but I'm sure you can learn something from this session. We'll have two opportunities for participants to ask questions. We do apologize, but due to the time constraint, we might not be able to get to everyone, but our presenters will surely try. And during the Q&A session, if you do have a question, if you don't mind typing the question in the chat box window, appreciate that. Uh, before I start, I would just want to introduce our two guest speakers that we have today. First, we have Justin Burks. Justin is a water conservation specialist with Santa Clara Valley Water District, specializing in indoor water use efficiency, gray water use, and landscape water use management. With a Bachelor of Science in Ecology, Justin has extensive knowledge and experience in protecting endangered or rare native plant species, promoting healthy soils, and ecological restoration that he applies daily to help support a resilient, sustainable water supply for the people of Santa Clara County. Next, our other speaker is Ashley Shannon, and Ashley is also a water conservation specialist with Valley Water and runs their landscape rebate program, among others. Ashley received an AS in landscape horticulture and worked as a landscape designer before receiving a BS in environmental studies. As a water conservation special specialist, Ashley has combined her background in horticulture with her passion for sustainability to develop educational and incentive programs to encourage water wise landscaping. And thank you both for joining us today. Again, we're super excited to have you here. And I'll hand it over to our presenters. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, my name is Justin Burks. Um, I just wanted to thank Lisa and the San Jose Libraries for helping organize this webinar to help educate all of you on water conservation in the garden. Uh, as we proceed with this presentation, we have a lot of content to cover, um, but I just wanted to give you a quick roadmap of what we'll be discussing. Uh, first, uh, Valley Water, the Santa Clara Valley Water District, just a brief overview about us, and then we'll get into the uh, nitty gritty of what you're here for, where you'll learn a, little, uh, a bit about uh, soil health and soil moisture, reducing evaporation, just some general tips for water conservation in the vegetable garden, as well as alternate water sources that you can use safely in your garden. And at the very end, we'll talk a bit about some of our water conservation programs that are available to any resident in Santa Clara County that can help you increase the efficiency of how you use water in your landscape. Next slide, please. So while I wait for the next slide, um, you'll soon see, um, oh, uh, you'll soon see, uh, soon see some of Valley Water's major responsibilities for Santa Clara County. We provide a safe, reliable water supply, safe um, flood protection, and environmental stewardship. We have two websites that provide a lot of information regarding water conservation. Our own website, watersavings.org, um, um, is where you can visit for all of our program information. There's also southbaygreengardens.org, which is a multi-agency page where you can learn about sustainability practices that you can implement in your own landscape. Yeah, um, sorry, just to interrupt just for a second, Justin. Um, 
would you mind let's switch the sharing of the screen um mine seems to have frozen um apologies everyone we'll just one second um we'll have justin queue up the sharing of his All right, sorry about, about that, everyone. Visuals are important. So just real quick, um, this is what I was just talking about, about some of Valley Water's major responsibilities for Santa Clara County. We're also the groundwater management agency and water wholesaler for the county. Uh, watersavings.org, you'll see a couple other times in the slideshow. And whenever you wanna get really in depth with a sustainability topic, visit South Bay Green Gardens. So why is conservation important? Well, for one, we've made amazing efforts in our county. We use about the same amount of water as we did in the mid 1990s overall. And that is all thanks to efforts that people like you have been implementing for years on end, whether it's a drought or not. But we still have a long way to go. And we're really excited to talk to you about how you can grow more food using less water. This pie chart on the left just shows uh, the breakdown of where water is currently used in our county. Residences use a little more than half of the overall water and existing older homes and particularly older irrigation systems is a large proportion of that. One of the largest energy consumers in the state of California is actually the movement and treatment of water. So whenever we individually or collectively make improvements in how we use water in our landscapes, not only do we have more water available for everyone, we also have positive impacts on mitigating climate change and reducing carbon emissions uh, in our area. So it's a big win-win all around to conserve water. Um, and I just wanted to plug the, that most of the photos you'll be seeing today are from Ashley Shannon's own garden and family. So with that, I'm gonna to transition to Ashley uh, for what we're all here about. Thanks for the introduction. Talk to you later. All right, thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, that last photo was a, a form of inefficient irrigation. So, um, you know, just a, a note, two-year-olds are not efficient at irrigating. Um, apparently dirt is funner to water than plants. But, um, so thank you, Lisa and Justin. I'm really excited to talk about this. Um, I, um, I do a background in landscaping um, and my passion is water conservation. So, um, you know, I get to talk to customers um, all day about how to conserve, um, ideally in the landscape. Um, but I'm also an avid home vegetable gardener. Um, and so this is this topic is is fun for me to talk about. So I'm going to talk about um, basic principles of water conservation in the vegetable garden. But actually, these principles really apply to just landscaping in general. So most of what we're talking about today can be um, um, adapted and applied to the rest of your landscape. So your shrubs and your trees and your perennials, maybe your herb gardens. Um, these basic concepts are. Um, um, are really universal in the landscape. But today we're gonna to focus on um, the vegetable garden specifically. So we'll, we'll talk about, um, you know, basically from the ground up, talk about soil moisture, um, uh, reducing evaporation. We'll talk about plants and different things that you can do um, with the plants um, for, ir for efficiency. And lastly, we're gonna talk about um, irrigation systems. Um, now I am, um, I do have background in landscaping. Um, water conservation is my main focus, but I, um, you know, while I love vegetable gardening, I definitely don't consider myself an authority on um, all things vegetable gardening. So um, for this presentation today, um, I won't be able to answer questions, uh, Justin, about, um, you know, um, uh, vegetable garden fertilization, pest management, um, other issues, other things that are outside of water conservation. Um, one, for, for time reasons, and then two, um, we have um, others who are uh, a more valuable resource on those. And so if you aren't familiar with the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara, um, they are a really you know, great group of um, a very knowledgeable um, gardeners who have gone through a lot of training um, 
and personal experience to be um, educators in all things uh, sustainable landscape. And so um, it, they have a wonderful website. Um, so um, we have the, the website down below, um, but they have a lot of information about vegetable gardening. I use their site pretty often just for my home garden. One of my favorite tools um, is their vegetable planting chart. So they have a chart for our county specifically that'll tell, um, give recommendations on um, month to month on what um, what plants to plant and whether it should be seed or um, or um, um, what's the word little plant <laughs> seedling starter. Um, they also have a bunch of garden videos, advice and tips. Um, so they are a really great resource. So if you have questions that are related to um, you know, pest management or really specific, um, you know, issues that you're having within your garden that are outside of water conservation. Um, I definitely recommend using them as a resource and directing those, those questions towards them. I'll move to the next. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. We have to remember who has control of this now. So, um, okay. So with water conservation, um, it's really important to kind of start start at the bottom and work our way up. So um, the soil, um, our soils are really the most important thing that you can focus on in the landscape. If you don't have a healthy soil um, and your soil doesn't have the capacity to hold um, water and nutrients in it, you are going to constantly be struggling with your plants. Um, and you might have to, um, you might struggle with pests and have to, you know, um, do a lot more to add pesticides, things like that to, to combat it. Um, you might have plants that don't take up nutrients very well. Um, and these, these problems are often seen manifested in the plant, but it's really a problem that starts with the soil. So um, you know, really taking the time to build your soil is probably the best thing that you can do for the landscape. Um, soils have the ability to, um, to, to hold water in them and um, uh, make that water available to roots. Um, but we have different types of soil. And so those soils hold water differently. Um, if you can imagine, you know, pouring water through a bucket of sand, that water is going to flow through really quickly. Um, and it's not going to stay in place and be available to the plants. Um, conversely, we have a lot of clay soils in our county. Um, clay takes a long time to absorb water. Um, and it holds on to really excuse me, it holds onto water really well, um, but sometimes it holds onto water a little bit too well. So the, the really tiny particles of clay hold onto water really tightly and sometimes that tight bond um, doesn't allow the, the, the roots to actually use that water because the soil is holding onto it so tightly. So what we want to do is have a good balance of um, you know, that sand and clay and organic matter. And organic matter is um, basically decomposed material. So mostly decomposed plants, but there's also, you know, decomposed little bugs and animals in there and stuff too. Um, and this organic material um, acts as a sponge in, in your soil. Um, so this sponge is gonna hold onto water, um, but it's gonna hold on onto it in a way that um, is going to make it available to your plants. Um, organic matter also adds um, nutrients to your soil. Um, and so this is going to reduce your needs to apply fertilizers, whether those are organic or synthetic. Um, this organic matter, um, you know, is naturally breaking down. This is a natural cycle. If you go into, um, you know, in, into a forest or something, you know, all those leaves are dropping, all those trees are dropping their leaves. It's decomposing into the ground. It's cycling into the soil. And this is natural cycle. Um, in our gardens, we have a tendency to remove plant material from, um, from the top of the soil. Um, and we, we break that nutrient cycle. And so um, composting, um, adding compost or organic matter to our soil is a way to um, kind of take us back to that, that natural process. So um, in practice, um, it's, a, it's a really great practice, you know, maybe a couple times a year, um, you know, a few weeks or a month before you plan on planting um, to add a few inches of mulch into your, into your garden. So um, for this, you would spread, you know, maybe two to three inch layer um, more if you can or if you need it of, of mulch, um, sorry, not mulch, of compost, um, organic matter to the top of the soil and either you know, let that naturally um, cycle in if you're doing a no-till or um, dig that into the soil. And so by increasing the percentage of organic matter in your garden, um, you increase the ability for that soil to hold water significantly, which means that you have to water it less, which is great. Um, there's a number of different types of, uh, there's a few materials that you can add um, that are, that are um, uh, um, soil amendments. Um, 
and this is you know most commonly is compost and so this these are you know plants that have um, broken down into a nice you know earthy uh, material um, there's aged compost um, aged manure um, aged or composted manure um, if you're going to add manure into your landscape um, just be sure that it's that it's aged well and that it's composted um, it should not smell fresh it shouldn't smell bad um, one because you don't really want something super stinky in your garden, your neighbors won't like you too much. Um, but also um, young or you know, fresh um, manure has a lot of ammonia in it. Um, it's a little harsh for your plants. And there's also the potential for pathogens um, to spread through there, especially if you're using it on your, your vegetable garden. So if you are gonna use um, manure in your landscape, just make sure that it's um, well composted and, and that it's aged. Um, it's also great to put it in the soil, um, on top of the soil, you know, well before you plan on planting so it has time to to kind of mellow out um, even more. Um, and, and then the last thing that you can add um, to your soil to, to build up your soil and build healthy soils are um, cover crops. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. All right. So uh, a cover crop is um, essentially um, a, a plant that you would plant um, and allowed to, to grow. And this plant is used um, and harvested not necessarily for food, although some of them um, you know, do produce food as well, but it's grown and harvested as a way to, um, to, to build up more um, organic matter in the soil. Um, so these cover crops are usually, um, you know, usually put people put them in um, into areas over winter. So maybe in late fall, um, early winter, um, these areas will be seeded. Um, the plants are allowed to grow, um, allowed to to grow and mature, um, and then you know a few weeks or a month or so before you plan on planting in the areas, um, you would cut these cover crops down. Um, and there's a few different methods that you can use to kind of reincorporate them back into the soil. So um, you could cut them all at the base um, and then gather up that green material and put it into your compost bin um, to compost that way, um, or you could cut them all down at the base. Um, you know, cut them up into, into smaller pieces, leave them in place, um, and allow them to de decompose um, on top of the soil and act as a mulch for the soil. Or, sorry, I have a really loud dog. I'm going to mute for a second. And there's actually, um, uh, gives a lot of love to her, to her dog. Um, sorry. Um, cool. She, especially loud when there's a, um, a delivery truck around, so she should be fine now. <laughs> I was able to get my kids out of the house, not the dog today. So these are the, the things that come up with, uh, with um, working from home now. So, um, so with the cover crops, um, you know, you can, you can till them in, you can leave them in place, um, but essentially what you're doing is reusing that material and you're leaving the roots in place specifically um, and not removing from them, those from the soil because they're gonna break down into the soil and add nutrients. Um, another thing that cover crops do, um, in addition to adding this organic material to your soil to increase water hold holding capacity, is they add nutrients back into your soil. So again, this is a, a natural, um, more organic way of, um, of fertilizing a soil. Um, some cover crops, um, and I think I get really excited about this, it's really nerdy, but I think that it's really cool. Um, so some cover crops actually will, will fix nitrogen. So what they do is they will pull nitrogen out of the air as the plant is growing, and they'll store that nitrogen um, in their roots. And on the right, the picture on the right hand side is a fava bean that I've pulled out of the ground. Um, just to take a picture of it, normally I would leave it in the ground. Um, but there's some little round, um, little nodules on those roots that are pink or white. And these nodules is, are what's storing this, um, this nitrogen. And so um, when you leave the roots in place and you allow them to decompose into the landscape, that nitrogen is then released into your landscape. Um, this is all, cover crops are also a really great way of kind of protecting your soil over the winter. Uh, we do live in a mellow climate and we can vegetable garden year round. Um, but sometimes, you know, I get burnt out <laughs> by the end of the season or I get a little bit lazy or maybe there's particular areas that I just want to give a rest. Um, and so this is a great tool to, um, to allow these plants to, to grow and to seed. Um, they're going to choke out any other weeds that might come in. So it's going to reduce the amount of um, weed competition that you have. Um, 
and also they're just they're good at um, you know holding the soil in place, um, protecting it from erosion. Um, if, especially if you have a vegetable garden that's not in a raised bed, um, these plants are going to protect your soil over the winter. So, um, so as far as your soils, um, your, your main goal is to build that water um, uh, holding capacity and to add in as many natural um, you know elements. Uh, to the landscape so you can reduce the amount of synthetic fertilizers and other things that you have to, to add to the soil later. Um, what? So um, next we're going to talk about kind of the next layer in, um, in the landscape. And um, so, oh, oh sorry, um, one, other, one other element that I, I skipped over. But um, this, this is kind of a fun thing to talk about. Um, it's not a practice that's used, um, you know, a lot in the landscape, but it's something that I've um, become familiar with over the last couple of years. And this is um, a, a practice called hugel culture. And so, what um, what hugel culture is is it's a technique of um, of building mounds, building these raised mounds or beds um, out of decaying wood debris. Um, and other compostable um, materials such as twigs, sticks, um, leaves, grass, things that you have on site that may you know normally be going into a landfill. It's a way to keep these items on site and so I use this technique um, in my vegetable beds in the front yard and I kind of layered it like a lasagna and so I started with bigger um, the bigger chunks so there's logs um, these are all from an old age tree um, that's been kind of sitting around for years um, and built that up with um, you know, twigs, grass, and then finally topped it off with a layer of, um, of um, uh, landscaping soil that I purchased. Um, and the great thing about this is, um, you know, not only is it going to add to my landscape, but it also allowed me to um, um, to use um, to use these materials and keep them out of the landfill. But also, I didn't have to buy as much soil, <laughs> which was really exciting. Um, and so. Um, apologies, my notes just went away for a second. Um, so what this does is it, it helps to, um, as far as water conservation goes, um, these logs and twigs and stuff that are in, um, that are buried down below, they act as a kind of a water storage um, area. So when it rains during the winter, um, these, these logs and twigs and stuff start to soak up that water. Um, and then as it gets hotter in the summer because they're, you know, they're deep in the ground, um, it holds on to that water um, and doesn't evaporate. And so when your plant's roots start to grow deep, um, especially like something like your tomato, it'll be able to access this water. Um, it's just a, it's a really fun concept. Um, I definitely encourage you to, to look into it. Um, you know, it's more for, for a, a newer, um, you know, if you're building a new bed, or something, but um, it's uh, oh, kind of cool. Um, so okay, so next we're going to move into the the next layer um, of um, of the process as far as water conservation goes. Um, so once you've built up a really healthy soil, what you want to do is um, protect that soil and protect the water that's in that soil. And so mulch is a really easy, really effective way um, to conserve water. Um, and what mulch does is essentially it's a physical barrier um, that between, your sun, between the sun and your soil, um, and it acts to um, reduce erosion um, um, it, it acts to, um, sorry, reduce evaporation. Um, and so it's, it's just a really, really simple concept. But if you have, you know, a good, good layer, um, you, know, at, you know, two to four inches, maybe the, the deeper the better of mulch, um, you can help to reduce um, water usage significantly. Um, some reports I've seen um, say that, you know, a three to four inch layer of, um, of, uh, of mulch can help reduce your water usage by 50%. Um, and so, um, you know, it's a, it's a really great tool to use. Um, mulch also helps reduce um, uh, the amount of weeds that you have in your landscape. And weeds, not only are they a pest, because um, you have to pull them, but they are, um, they're competing for, um, um, for water and nutrients with your vegetables. So you want the water that you're applying to your landscape to go directly to, um, to your vegetables and not to um, a weed that you're not gonna be able to use. And so mulch helps to um, you know, um, um, inhibit these um, you know, weed seeds from, from germinating. Um, there's a lot of different types of mulch that you can use, um, especially in the vegetable garden. 
I have been using um, leaves, leaf mulch. Um, one, because it's, it's available and it's free, <laughs> uh, which I, I like, you know, using what I have on site. Um, I have a maiden tree that has very small leaves, um, and so I just use the leaves as they are. Um, if you have bigger, chunkier leaves, um, you might look into, um, it might be beneficial to break up those leaves um, before you use them as mulch. Um, you can also use uh, wood chips, um, just like a traditional wood chip that uh, people would use in their landscape. Um, um, a wood chip mulch is either, um, you know, made out of uh, uh, bark um, from different plants. Lots of times it's a different trees, like a, um, a fir bark is pretty common, um, or some, some is made out of recycled um, wood material, uh, which is a little more sustainable. Um, coarse compost is also a great, um, um, a, a great mulch. Um, and so, you know, you can either work that compost into your soil um, or add it as a, um, as a, um, as a mulch. Um, if you did work the compost into the soil, I wouldn't consider that a mulch. Um, so you'd still want a layer on top of that. Um, but, but coarse compost r works really well. Um, there's not a lot of places for, um, it's not as easy for critters to hide in there that might um, eat your vegetables. Um, straw is really common as a mulch and vegetable garden, but because it is a little bit bigger and fluffier, um, you, you can run into um, instances where you might have um, snails or other bugs that are, that are hiding in there. Um, um, of course, compost is just compost that, um, you know, hasn't been broken down as much. Um, so, um, you know, there's compost that you can buy that might be really, really fine. If it's a little bit coarser, it's going to stay in place a little bit longer. Um, it's going to decompose back into your soil a little bit slower, so you'll have to replenish it a little bit slower. But either one works. It's just that the, the coarse compost um, might stick around a, bit, a little bit longer and you won't have to replace it as soon. Um, but straw, um, you can break the straw down a little bit more. It's helpful um, to break the straw down a little bit more before you lay it down. So um, you can use that. There's there's leaf mulcher, um, you know, things that you can buy or well, tools. Um, you can run a lawnmower over it, um, things like that. But um, but that is helpful. So um, you know, mulches are they're really important um, uh, in in just keeping that water um, in place. I can move on um, and then, then we'll move up um, to um, another layer. Oh, lastly, um, we do have a series of quick videos, um, a little tips for the landscape, um, other videos about a program on our website, and we have one specifically that's about using leaves as mulch. Um, it's just a quick two minute video. Um, I encourage you to, to check it out. Um, and we also offer a series of, um, of publications that we allow, like the, um, that we give out to customers, such as the, um, the soil one I mentioned earlier, but we have one that's devoted to mulch as well. So those are the resources that we, um, that we offer. All right, we can move to the next. Okay, um, so as we're moving kind of up in, in, in our level, we've, we have a healthy soil, we have mulch in place, um, and, and mulch, you know, it, it, sometimes it might be helpful to add the mulch after the plants, um, but um, I'm gonna talk about plants after mulch. <laughs> um, but there's things that you can do when you're planting or, or considerations that you can take um, in your planting to help um, conserve water as well. Um, one concept that applies to not only the vegetable garden, but also um, your, um, your ornamental garden is to group plants by water needs. Um, if you have a garden where you have a bunch of different plants with low water needs and medium and high all grouped together, um, chances are you're gonna have to end up irrigating the whole area um, especially if you have an automatic irrigation system, to those plants that are gonna show signs of stress first, so those plants that need more water. Um, but if you are able to kind of section things off um, depending by water needs, um, you can water specifically to those plants and what they need. Um, you know, this might include um, you know, grouping things that have more shallow root systems like beans or greens together, um, as opposed to things that have a deeper root system like tomatoes or corn. Um, but also, you know, some of them are heavier or lighter water users. So, um, you know, a tomato is going to use less water, um, definitely less frequently, um, you know, than your lettuces and stuff. So getting to know your plants and their water needs. Now, um, you know, a lot of us don't have huge vegetable gardens, which I totally understand, just have a few beds. And if you're like me, you want to plant as many things in there as possible. And it's not always um, realistic to you know, have the space to group things by plant needs. Um, but if you're able to, um, um, it's, a, it's a good technique to employ. 
Um, another technique is planting in blocks instead of rows. Um, if we have, you know, kind of long rows with spaces in between them, um, there's more opportunity for, um, you know, sun, um, you know, sun exposure on either sides of those rows, uh, rows uh, which can increase evaporation. Um, if you're planting in blocks, the plants um, will kind of act as their own mulch after a while and, and shade the soil um, and reduce evaporation. It's also a little easier to irrigate, um, you know, a block of plants um, that has one specific water needs as opposed to, you know, when they're in rows that are kind of next to each other. Um, so it's a uh, one technique that you can that you can employ. Um, another one, and this goes for um, kind of most gardening in general, is um, you're really timing the establishment of your plants um, for for times when um, they're going to require less water. So um, you know, most of our, us are excited to get our plants in in early spring anyway, so you're, you're probably doing this anyway. Um, but if you're getting your plants established, the earlier that you get them established, um, the larger the root system is going to be um, and shade coverage from their leaves by the time we get into summer and, and the heat of the summer. Um, if you're planting things late in the planting season, um, you're going to have to irrigate them more while you're um, establishing those new plants. So really try to get on top of it and get your plants in early. Um, I believe our last frost date um, is mid-February, um, latest February. Most things can go um, you know, in the ground after that date, but that Master Gardener's planting chart um, is a really great, great thing to reference. Um, it's also important with your plants to, to know the signs of water stress. Um, and so I have a couple examples here. Um, of, of my plants and how they look um, that, you know, for a second make me panic and think that they don't have enough water. So the plant on the right is a, um, is a pumpkin plant. It looks really wilted. Um, this, um, you know, appears to be a sign of not having enough water, but what it actually is is a reaction to the temperature. So this is the middle of the day, the hottest point. Um, this plant is naturally going to wilt. Um, but if the plant perks back up in the evening or by morning, um, I know that, that the wilting was not caused by a lack of water, but was instead just caused by the heat. Um, this one, you know, by the evening after I took this plant, it was perky and happy again. Um, I also took a look and, you know, moved the mulch out of the way and checked the soil and I could tell that it was moist. So instead of, um, you know, automatically giving this plant water when it's showing stress, um, you know, just kind of learning the signs of it. Um, the other one, um, the picture on the left is a photo of, um, of a tomato leaf that has curled. And, and this can be caused by a number of things. Insects can do this too, but, um, but leaf curl is also, you know, another reaction to, um, to temperature and to heat. And so it's a natural mechanism for the plant um, to reduce um, its transpiration by, by curling its leaves. Um, and so with both of these, um, you know, after taking a look at them and checking the soil, and I could tell that, that you know, it was moist enough. It's just that these plants had, um, um, these are natu natural coping mechanisms for, for a lot of heat. Um, so just, you know, kind of get, get to know your plants, um, um, you know, just like anything. Um, they're going to they're gonna show you signs um, when they're stressed. Um, and lastly with plants is um, just trying to plant varieties that, um, you know, maybe require less water. Um, you know, different, different Varieties are, are better suited for different regions. Um, I think the master gardeners list is a good one to look at. Um, um, you know, vegetable gardening is it's going to use water. It, it's not. Um, it's never going to be you know as low water use as um, you know a, a, a California native garden or um, you know a Mediterranean garden um, that you only have to water. You know, maybe never in the summer um, for the California natives. Um, it is it is water intensive, um, but it, it can be less intensive. Um, you know, if we're employing the right techniques and choosing plants that are um, that are more adapted for this area. Um, some varieties of tomatoes. Um, if you're familiar with dry farming, um, that's a technique essentially where the tomatoes are established and they're grown for their whole season um, without any supplemental water. Um, these tomatoes. Um, end up with a really intense, you know, concentrated flavor. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, they do have the ability to do that. But, um, you know, if you were trying to do that with a big beefsteak heirloom tomato, um, it probably wouldn't work quite as well. So just, um, you know, kind of explore the different varieties and, and, and things that you can use in the landscape. All right, and go to the next slide. All right, so we're gonna take a little break um, right in the middle for some questions. I know that was a lot of information. Um, 
and I saw some questions popping up. Um, and so we can take maybe, maybe about three minutes um, and answer a few questions and then we'll have some time at the end too. So I think um, Lisa has some of those queued up. Yeah, the first question is um, black aphids, first time shown in my garden this year. Is it bad for other plants as in fruit, vegetable and herbs in my garden? That's one question. That one, um, you know, that's a question I would direct more to the master gardeners. Um, you know, aphids, um, a lot of times insects are signs of stress in your plants. I mean, plants that are stressed are more susceptible to insects. Um, so, you know, take a look at your soil. And it might be that you're, um, you know, you, you do need to add some more um, organic matter to your soil or be more consistent about watering. Um, often it's a, it's a sign of stress, um, but I won't, um, um, I won't have too much time to get into to more detail on the um, aphid control. I just have one anecdotal thing to add, which is um, I had an aphid problem in my native plant garden that you can see behind me, and I added ladybugs and it solved the problem. But very important distinction is that it's not a vegetable garden and that there's going to be nuance on when that is and it is not appropriate. And as Ashley said, the master gardeners will really help you get into detail about understanding that nuance. Great. And then someone else is asking, what's coarse compost? Yeah, that one I saw it pop up. Um, I think I addressed it. Um, it was oh, just, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, no, that's okay. Um, I kind of saw it. But it, yeah, it's just, um, you know, you, compost can be really compost and be really fine. Um, um, or compost, um, you know, that hasn't been sifted. There's always going to be larger chunks in compost. Um, sometimes those larger chunks are sifted out when you purchase it. But if you, if you have some that has those larger chunks in them, um, those are good too because it's gonna um, it's gonna take longer for that to break down into the soil, so you might have to replace it less often. But either one, either one is fine. Okay. Then we have another question about mulch for lead or straw mulch. Are we concerned about the potential for fire hazard or leaf? Um, sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, with leaf. Yeah, um, yeah. There is always that concern. I mean, most natural landscapes are going to have leaf litter in them. Um, in the vegetable garden specifically, um, you know, that is getting irrigated pretty often. Um, so I would just say, you know, know your surroundings. If you are in, um, um, you know, uh, more fire-prone areas, um, I would maybe check in with your local um, fire department to see what they recommend for that. Um, but yeah, that that could be a concern. Um, um, to, you know, I, I definitely recommend um, looking looking into that. But all mulch and um, you know, mulch in general has that potential um, for fire concern. But um, you know, think about where you are located um, and how much of a concern that would be based on your your home specifically. Okay. Um, someone's asking about a low water vegetable garden. They want to lay out a um, a building. Uh, I, I guess a design. And they're asking for services you recommend. Is that something that um, I'm not sure if you could even touch on that, but um, I don't know if yeah, you know. Where we... I'd say maybe, you know, again, I'd for, you know, if you want help planning out a vegetable garden, the, the master gardeners might have good tips on that. They offer, um, they also offer a lot of um, classes and events too. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd recommend using them as a, as a service. Um, you know, a lot of landscapers, especially ones that, that focus on um, native plants and sustainable design, um, I know a lot of them really have a passion for, for adding edibles into the landscape also. So um, if you are interested in employing a landscape designer, I, I recommend looking into those that really focus on, um, um, you know, sustainable native gardens and chances are they're probably pretty into edibles too. Okay, that's a great, great input. Then someone else is asking about mulch. When laying mulch, do you need to worry about water from a hose or sprinkler not penetrating into the soil? Um, so we'll get into irrigation a little bit more, um, but essentially, no, um, the water is going to flow through. Um, ideally, if you have a you know some sort of a drip irrigation system, it's going to be under the mulch, um, not on top of the mulch. Um, definitely, some of the water that you apply is going to get um, absorbed into the mulch, but hopefully, that that ends up um, you know going into the ground and usually just you know watering slowly um is really the key um yeah if you're if you're watering with a hose that's full blast um on the mulch it's probably you know it might run off um it probably would have run off your your soil too and then um someone is asking about pest management i just wanted to point out i have um after 
this class, I could send you the Master Gardeners link of their website. They actually have a very in-depth pest management section that I highly recommend. So um, moving on, composting food scraps buried in the ground. Again, that's a pest management and they are excellent resources and I'll definitely get back to you on that. Um, and then, oh, thank you. And then someone provided a link too <laughs> about disease and pest and rats. So thank you DVS for that. All right, let's, um, let's hold off on questions and then move, um, we'll move through the, the next um, section of it. Um, of this and we'll talk about um, kind of the, the next thing, which is, um, you know, irrigation. So, um, you know, techniques and then also alternative um, irrigation that you can use. So um, with efficient irrigation, I'm going to talk about um, low tech and then high or higher tech um, techniques that you can use. So some low tech te techniques um, that don't really involve you, you know, purchasing new equipment or, and redoing your whole system is just, um, you know, focusing on when you apply water. Um, so if you, um, you know, it, it's ideal to water early in the morning um, or in the evening. Um, early in the morning allows water to um, soak into the soil without um, evaporating. So you want to reduce the amount of water that's lost. Um, and so by the time that water has soaked down into the soil and you get into the hotter times of the day, that water is available for the root system. Um, if you're watering right during the middle of the day, especially if you're using a hose and you're spraying your plants, um, you're going to lose a lot of water to, to evaporation. Um, and also it's really not, you know, not great for the plants if it's really hot to, um, to get their leaves wet. Um, that can cause additional problems. Um, if you're watering in the evening, and I know I have a tendency to water my garden mostly in the evening because that's when I have time. Um, I try to do it, you know, in the evening after it's cooled down, um, but you know, giving the garden enough time to kind of dry out before nighttime comes so I'm not um, uh, creating a situation where, um, you know, fungus can grow or other, other things that might be, um, you know, bad for the leaves of the plants. Um, but really timing your, your watering can, can save a lot of water. Um, another thing to do is just to check your moisture levels before watering. So instead of getting on a regular schedule of always going out and watering at the same time of the day, check your landscape or check the soil, um, you know, before you water to see if you actually need to. Um, and there's a few techniques for this. One is just, um, you know, your fingers are a really great tool <laughs> for gauging how moist your soil is. So push that mulch back in one spot, um, you know, stick your finger down in the soil a bit. If it feels moist, um, you probably don't need to water. Um, you can also check the moisture with um, something like a, a wooden skewer. So if you if you stick the skewer down in the ground and you pull it out and it's wet and there's some soil soil sticking to it, um, you know it's probably moist enough that you don't need to add additional water. Um, but another way to check it and a fun tool um, is a soil moisture meter. Um, we actually um, we give these out. They're just a really simple tool um, that you you don't leave them in the ground. Um, you just check. Um, there's a kind of a um, a copper skewer um, on the bottom of it um, that you plug in and it'll let you know, um, you know, whether your soil is moist or dry or wet. Um, in this case, you know, I see that it's um, teetering on, um, you know, between dry and moist. And so I'd probably give this, um, this area some water, especially since it's got lettuce in it. Um, but if it was higher up in the wet range or even the, you know, the higher up part of the moist range, um, I wouldn't water this area. And so this is also a fun tool to use um, with kids to just kind of get them excited about, um, about the garden. So we, we do offer these. Um, if anybody's interested, they can, we'll provide resources to contact us for those. Um, another technique for, for irrigation is just slow and low. So you want to apply the water to the soil as slowly as possible. So I definitely would avoid a hose that's just kind of gushing out water. Um, chances are, you know, our Soil can only absorb water so fast, um, um, and so um, if you have if you're applying water faster than the soil can absorb it, then you're going to get runoff and, and water waste. So if you're watering by hand, um, you know use a, a gentle setting, a shower setting on the, the hose nozzle that you have. Um, turn your hose on really low. Um, sometimes I'll turn it on, you know, just so it's almost just dripping out, and kind of leave it in an area for a while. Set a timer. Um, always set a timer because <laughs> um, my son, my four-year-old, reminded me yesterday that I had forgotten. Remember that one time you forgot to turn the water off and you wasted water? Um, thank you for reminding me. Um, 
but you know, just try to get the water um, as, as slow as possible to the plants. Um, and you also want to keep that water low down to the ground. Um, you know, plants grow by um, absorbing water through their root system, not um, necessarily through their leaves. You know, some, you know, some do, but, um, but, um, but really you want to concentrate that water where the plant needs it, which is at the, uh, at the ground level and um, you know, below, um, below the leaves. Um, another thing that you can do that's really low tech and easy is just to collect, um, you know, potable water from your home um, that you're using to maybe rinse off um, your fruits and vegetables at the kitchen sink um, or to collect um, or that shower water that's um, the cold water that's running through that's warming up to collecting that in a bucket. So those two forms of water um, are, um, you know, considered a gray water, but they're, um, um, you know, they're going to be safe to use um, in your landscape. And so, you know, these are also really great for, you know, pots, maybe if you have pots around the house, um, you know, just taking that water, collecting it, and then um, going out and adding it to the landscape. Because this is clean, potable water that's essentially just flowing kind of straight out of your, out of the tap into the, um, into the drain, and there's a way to, to use that irrigation. Um, also, um, just watering less frequently and more deeply um, is effective. And so, um, you know, instead of going out, um, um, and, and when I say rinse off vegetables, um, you know, sink water, I'm not talking about reusing your sink water that you're washing dishes or, or cleaning, you know, chicken in or anything. Literally, like if you have an apple and you're rinsing it under the tap, um, you know, you can, you can catch that water. So really just when you're rinsing um, soaps. I, I don't tend to use soaps on, on when I'm rinsing vegetables. Um, if you are, maybe consider not using that water if the soap isn't um, like a biodegradable one. Um, but, um, but if you're concerned, you know, the, the shower water, just focus on collecting your, your shower water. Um, that'd be great. So um, water deeply and less frequently. So if you're going out and watering your, wa your plants a little bit every day, um, those roots are going to get used to having water um, just at the top layer of the soil um, and they're not going to have to work and go more deeply. Um, for, they're not going to be encouraged to go more deeply and so um, they're going to dry out faster. So what you want to do is water less frequently um, but deeper to encourage um, a good deep root system. I right, can move to the next. Sorry I'm realizing that we're um, so time's getting a little bit later, but we have a few more to go through. <laughs> so um, for higher tech, um, you know, higher, higher tech irrigation, um, if, you're, if you're willing, I do um, you know, recommend um, using um, some sort of a low flow drip irrigation system. Um, ideally one that is um, what's referred to as an inline drip system. So this is tubing, um, and I have an example of it on the top in the middle. Um, tubing that has these emitters that are built into it, they're factory installed and they're installed um, at um, regular intervals, whether that's you know, nine inches or 12, um, and they put out water at a very slow, steady rate. Um, and these can be, um, if you're using the thinner one, which is a, like a quarter inch tubing, um, it can be snaked around um, your, your vegetable bed. Um, the, the, the thicker ones are good if you lay them out kind of a grid, they're a little more rigid. Um, but laying them out in a grid system, and they slowly and evenly um, will irrigate your, your landscape. Um, a soaker hose is another thing that you can use. Um, all those soaker hoses don't have pressure regulation within them, so you might have a tendency for um, more water to be coming out at one part of the hose and less um, at another, so that's one thing to consider. Um, if you are going to put in um, some sort of a drip system, just be mindful um, that the, these systems do require um, pressure regulation and filter. Um, so they're designed to work at a lower pressure. Um, if you're um, putting them in at a, on a system that doesn't have pressure regulation, you might get parts popping off and, and things don't work as well. So just um, keep that in mind. Um, these are great because, it, you know, they're consistent as well. Um, and so, you know, one of the things about vegetables is they want consistent irrigation. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that they want irrigation every day, but they do want it, you know, consistently. And um, your plants will show you signs of inconsistency, like a, um, if you've ever had blossom end rot on a tomato, where the, the bottom of the tomato is, you know, black and, um, you know, it's really sad. <laughs> um, you know, oftentimes that's caused um, by inconsistent watering. Um, um, so just, um, you know, a drip system is something that can um, help you with that. Um, with these drip systems, they're going to be on, um, 
and generally would be on a um, some sort of a controller system. If you do have an irrigation controller um, or an irrigation timer, and what that is is essentially a um, a device that turns water on and off when you want it to. Um, so a standard controller is just going to turn it on and off um, for whatever you set it for. And so it doesn't matter how hot it is that day or if it rained the day before um, or if it's really cloudy, it's gonna water at that same time um, you know, on schedule. Um, so if you have a controller like that, I recommend replacing it with um, a weather-based irrigation controller. And what a weather-based irrigation controller is, is a, um, it's a controller that um, that uses local weather data. So, you know, um, via satellite um, or via Wi-Fi connection. Um, um, and it uses this, you know, very localized data to make these automatic incremental adjustments to your irrigation. So, um, you know, even within this month, we might have July. July is a hot month, um, but we might have one week where the temperatures are, you know, in, in, in the high 90s and that whole entire week is just scorching. And then two weeks later, um, the temperatures are back down to the 80s or it might be cloudy um, and plants don't need the same amount of water um, during those same two weeks in that month of July. And so an irrigation controller can help make an adjustment and just give your plants um, the amount of water that they need, um, you know, based on any given day. Um, so we do offer rebates for irrigation controllers um, for upgrading to standard controllers to these uh, weather-based controllers. All right, can go to the next. All right, um, so lastly, um, we're gonna talk about irrigation um, alternatives. Um, and so there's a few things that you can do to reduce your reliance on um, potable water. And potable water is water that you would get from your, your tap or your hose um, that has gone through the process of being um, treated and transported and, and a lot of work to get it to the stage. Um, um, and what you wanna do is reduce kind of your dependency um, on that. So, you know, you can make your, your irrigation system as efficient as possible and then also use these um, alternative water sources to, to further conserve water. So rainwater capture is a, um, a great method for this. So um, if you wanna go big, there's cisterns. So we have an example of a, a cistern setup that's on the, um, the left. These are diagrams that we use um, for our rebate program um, for, for these items. Um, and then, um, you know, for most most homes, um, you'll probably go the, the route of having a rain barrel. And a rain barrel might be, you know, about 50 gallons, um, and it's just a way to, to collect water and store it so you can use it, um, um, use it later. Um, on the next slide, I have some examples of, um, of, um, of rain barrel setups, some people who have gone through our rebate process. Um, and they're just a, a great way to store water. Um, we, um, you know, we get about, 17 inches or so of water in San Jose. Um, if you have a thousand square foot area of roof, um, that roof throughout the year has the potential to collect over 10,000 gallons of water. Um, so that's a huge amount of water that can that can be saved. Um, now, you know, if you want to collect that all at once, you're going to use a, a big cistern. Um, but rain barrels are, are a great way to kind of um, you know collect that water during a rain period. Then if it dries out, um, you know, for a couple of weeks it gets a little bit warmer. You can use that water in your landscape, drain it. Next time it rains, you can fill it back up and kind of repeatedly drain and fill um, those rain barrels to really um, um, to use them efficiently. Um, the next slide just shows um, some calculations or some recommendations for, um, you know, maybe how many rain barrels you would use for a home. Um, you know, as I mentioned, if you're really gonna collect, um, um, you know, if we have like maybe a one inch rain period on a thousand square feet of roof area, um, that's going to collect around 600 gallons or so. Um, and so you can kind of think of it in that terms that, you know, maybe with a, um, you know, one inch is a lot at once, but, you know, with a half inch, um, um, you know, collecting like 300 gallons of water. So you can, um, these are, these are a great resource to add to, to um, collect water and, um, you know, that's, that's a, a free water source as well. So. Um, and then lastly, um, Justin's going to go into gray water systems um, as, a, as another alternative. Hey again, everyone. Um, just as a quick FYI, this is a very quick overview on uh, using gray water um, in your landscape. On our website, watersavings.org, you can find an entire three-hour workshop broken out into shorter digestible parts for you to dig really deep into gray water. Um, 
but in general, it can be as simple as a bucket in your shower, uh, like Ashley was describing, or it can be uh, very complicated, or, uh, including surge tanks and, and pumps and filters. Um, for uh, a vegetable garden and for growing fruit trees, I recommend a laundry landscape system. But whenever you're thinking about where on that spectrum of a uh, gray water system you might be interested in exploring more, I always recommend starting simple. And if the simplest option works best, do the simple option. Um, we offer a $200 or a $400 rebate for installing a laundry and landscape system. There's no permit involved with this type of gray water use. There are more, um, for more advanced systems, you do need permits um, in addition to a lot of labor to install them. So what is a laundry and landscape system in brief? Well, there's no surge tanks and there's no filters. You're using the soil itself to move the gray water through your landscape and to let it uh, infiltrate into your plant root zones. So on the left, uh, you'll see a little quick cartoon uh, of an example gray water system. Um, every system has a valve. It has a three-way diverter valve. Three-way diverter valves, valves are difficult to find, but the three uh, directions is really essential for these systems to work well because if you ever forget to turn the valve, um, it's always going to go either into your landscape or the sewer, as it does currently. So the benefit of that is it also helps you use your laundry like you typically do. If you need to run a bleach load, you still have that ability just to flip the switch and send it to the sewer. Um, but when you have a particularly hot day or you just don't want to use irrigation, uh, potable water in, your, in a large part of your garden, you have that ability to just flip the switch and send that gray water to, to your landscape. Um, an important component of a laundry landscape system is these mulch basins. Uh, a mulch basin uh, is probably a new phrase for most of you, but at its basic, it's just a trench filled with mulch. Um, and the mulch helps spread the water out so it doesn't run off, and so it maximizes the amount of plants that can benefit from that gray water use. Um, and you can actually see a, a photo of a, of a um, valve box that's been repurposed as a, as a shield protecting a, an outlet for uh, gray water. Um, one other important element when you think about a laundry and landscape system is that the piping is sized as the same diameter as the washer line. So in one way of thinking of it, you're almost like extending a drain line all the way into your landscape. Don't actually do that with a drain line. You'll want to use uh, a combination of PVC and polytubing once you get outside, but the diameter should always match the washer line. So if there's ever a clog or anything, it, the clog, um, the gray water's exit route is into your yard, which is what you would want. Um, also important thing about gray water is you do not store it. So unlike rainwater and rainwater systems, you wanna store it until you need it months later. With gray water, you use it within 24 hours or you send it to the sewer. So even in more complicated systems that have surge tanks, those are really just to help the pumps perform better. Um, they're not gonna store gray water for a long period of time. Um, if I was in an auditorium with all of you, I'd ask you to raise your hand if anyone had uh, ever left a load of laundry in their landscape, in their clothes washer over a long weekend and noticed that smell. So um, I know I've done that. That's part of the reason why you don't um, store gray water. You just use it and then let the landscape do the rest. This is a um, quick little cartoon of some essential components of a gray water system working left to right. Uh, again, there's that valve. There's, a, there's an air admittance valve also that helps the siphoning effect so that once water gets pushed out of the clothes washer, uh, gravity will push it into the landscape itself. Um, and then on the right, you can see a, um, another side view of a mulch basin. Mulch basins should always be flat on the bottom so that gray water gets spread evenly and typically just about the width of a shovel. Uh, so it's definitely a do-it-yourself type of project if you're a handy person. Uh, and you install the mulch basins at the drip line of the tree uh, or of the plant so that 
you get close enough for the plant to benefit, but not so close that you uh, stress out the root system. Um, so we do offer a rebate, as I mentioned. I've actually never seen in person um, a gray water system with a vegetable garden, but it is feasible. Um, I misspoke, sorry, um, a veggie bed, like the image on the left. I haven't seen that in person, but it is feasible. Uh, the image on the right, though, has benefited from one of Valley Water's gray water programs. Um, they're growing baby grapes, kale, chard, um, and a few other vegetables in a pretty small area. If you look closely, you can see the purple lids for the bow boxes that where the gray water is being distributed. And you can also see a combination of uh, coarser wood mulch and straw. Um, and then it, here's a couple images of some freshly installed, well, on the left it's a mature citrus plant being irrigated with gray water, and in the middle on the right photos are more mature uh, fruit trees being irrigated with gray water in very narrow areas. So there is a tricky element with a gray water system where you need to make sure you have enough of a footprint, enough space to actually install the mulch basins and the piping. Um, but as you can see, you can make it work. Um, and I know we're short on time and I want to give opportunity for everyone to ask questions. Again, um, I have a full video that really goes into detail about this. Um, and I've already touched on a lot of these things, but the last well, two points I want to get across, um, detergent choices. In general, liquid detergents have minimal impact on the pH of the soil, so that's good uh, for your plants. Um, and there's objective um, resources that you can look for. So there's the EPA Safer Choice, and then there's also the USDA's bio-based products certifications that, um, that help you identify detergents that are biocompatible uh, and don't have harsh constituents within them that you don't want um, growing with your food. Um, also, never grow root vegetables with gray water. So um, if you are only growing potatoes, carrots, beets, then consider rainwater and not gray water. But if you have berry bushes and fruit trees, definitely consider a gray water system for your home. Um, and you might be able to qualify for a rebate too. Um, this is a quick overview of the other types of incentive programs we offer. We, um, we have little rack cards we can mail to you if you email us um, that give you a really thorough but easy to quickly read overview of our rebate programs. Um, there's converting pools and turf um, into low water use plants. Um, vegetable gardens don't qualify for that, but there are um, a lot of flexibility in that program that Ashley would be happy to go into detail some other day. Um, and then we also have free services like um, outdoor surveys and free indoor kits that we can mail to you to help coach you how to evaluate, uh, how to be more efficient with how you use water inside your home. Um, and again, thank you for bearing with us with a little bit of technical difficulties at the beginning. This was really fun for both Ashley and I to prepare um, and working with Lisa and the San Jose Libraries to put this on up for all of you. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, at conservation at valleywater.org or at the hotline list above. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Justin and Ashley. Um, it was a great presentation. We learned a lot. Um, I wanted to emphasize we are gonna, we did record it. So we're gonna try to post it on our YouTube channel. Um, and I'll go ahead and end the recording here. But, um, and then Justin does have his contact information. I know someone that had asked that. And I will try to follow up with the links that were included and other resources. Um, a lot of great resources out there, and I encourage you to visit Valley Waters website as well. I did send a flyer out. There were some late registrants, so I'll make sure that everyone gets those flyers. It has a chock full of information on Valley Water um, and some points that they discussed in more detail. So thank you so much for everyone for attending, and thank you so much again, Justin and Ashley. Really appreciate it. And I'm happy to try to take a couple questions. I know we're a little late. Are you fine with that, Ashley? Uh, 
Yeah, I'm happy if anybody wants to stick around. I know that we've gone over um, five, but I, I do have a little bit more time um, if, um, if we do want to take a few more questions. Thank you for that. And then they're jealous of your garden, so am I, <laughs> both of them. <laughs> I'm just scrolling up here to see, um, some people are asking purchase questions like where can you buy rain barrels? And then where do you buy such gray water systems? That's something they can discuss with a landscaper perhaps? Yeah, um, for rain barrels, you know, I see all sorts of, um, of um, sources coming through. So some people order them online. Um, most of the box stores have versions of rain barrels. Um, there's also, um, there's um, like farm supply stores um, are a good resource or landscape supply stores. Um, but um, there's, um, there's, a, there's a lot of options out there. And then someone's asking cardboard, cardboard as mulch for a tomato garden. If you know anything about that, that might be a um, UC master yeah. gardener. Oh, you can answer that? Yeah, no, that's right. fine. Um, so the, you know, using the technique of sheet mulching um, where you're laying down cardboard can help um, you know, reduce weed competition. Um, it can be as simple as, you know, using boxes that you've broken up, um, you know, ideally removing the tape from them um, and laying them out in a layer so that they're overlapping a bit so you don't get gaps in it um, and then covering that with a decent amount of mulch. Um, you can also purchase um, uh, like a cardboard paper or rolled out paper. I know that um, I think some of the um, uh, the landfills in the area that also sell recycled um, material like wood chip mulch and things like that offer um, those and that can be that can be rolled out um, but really can be as simple as, as you want. You can also use um, several layers of, of newspaper um, works as well too. So in a vegetable garden um, you know it's something that's uh, dynamic and changing and um, you know if you want to just quickly lay out some some cardboard and put a thick layer of mulch on it um, um, you know, that'll, that'll break down throughout the season and you'll probably you know, add it again later as you replant or, or move things around. Great. Um, and someone is still asking about the gray water system. Um, just wondering where I can point them in the right direction or resource if you know off the top of your head. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, in my experience, it is hard to find all the components in one spot. But I do have um, that illustration that you saw, just that little snippet. It's part of a, a, a bigger two-sheeter. And on the back, there's a parts list for every um, cartoon image. But it includes a real-world image and what the part is called, which can help your research a little bit. Um, in general, I've noticed that my customers that uh, complete the rebate successfully use a combination of online stores and uh, and smaller um, irrigation stores that uh, actually have some of the harder to find components more commonly than the big box stores, which I can try to work with more uh, effectively to kind of bridge that gap. Um, the, harder finder, the harder to find components are the three-way diverter valve and the auto vent and the transition between the PVC and the polytubing at that one inch because most residential irrigation systems are not going to use a one inch uh, uh, piping. So it can be a little tricky to find that light up. But um, we really hope that our 200 or $400 rebate helps you in that journey. And one thing about all of our rebate programs, we really hope we uh, piqued your interest a little bit, but it's always essential to apply first and wait for our approval. Um, that helps us make sure there's funding available and that we're actually incentivizing you to, to do this work. And it also gives us an opportunity to send you some of these pinpointed resor resources to help you complete your project successfully and according to our requirements. Right. And, um, Great question. Yeah, thank you for asking that. And then I've seen a couple of questions about how to get in contact with us. Um, that conservation at valleywater.org um, is a really great way to contact us about all of our, our programs. So we have a lot of different people who are um, managing the different programs, but if you send them um, an email to the conservation at valleywater.org, um, it's probably the, the best route um, to contact for information about the, the programs and then it can be redirected to, um, you know, Justin and I specifically if it, it needs more in depth or we people can help, who can help out with um, 
you know, sending you general information or how to get started or helping you with that process. So I'd recommend um, using the, the conservation of valleywater.org. Phone number helps too, but right now because of um, um, the, the shelter in place and a lot of us are working home from home, um, we are checking our hotline number. Um, but there's there's some phone tag elements involved with it um, because we don't have someone in the office actively checking it. So I really recommend um, contacting us through um, through that email. Great. And then I, I assume that goes with um, just go to the website as well to learn more in-depth information yeah. about the rebates. Yeah. Yeah. Watersavings.org is a really great one-stop, um, easy to navigate um, area about um, our different rebates and programs. Terrific. Well, I mean, that was really fun. <laughs> yeah, thank you again. Really appreciate you guys taking your time. Spent a lot of time going over this and um, just really appreciate your, your expertise, and your dedication. Um, yeah. And uh, beautiful, I love your both your backyards. I'm so jealous. <laughs> the fun thing it is this is my time. front yard. So front yards do uh, not have to be lawns. Um, okay. They're a great place for a vegetable garden. And if it's the sunniest spot in your yard, turn it into a vegetable garden or a native yes. plant garden. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to talk to your neighbors and kind of hang out in your yard. So I was going to suggest to everyone to follow your, their Facebook page as well, because they, sh they post a r great information, virtual events and so forth. Um, and they have some, you know, uh, further ideas. Um, also, someone asked any risk of yellow jackets with rainwater barrel. I don't know if that's something you can address, but someone sent me that message just now. The rain barrels, they should be, um, they should have elements for vector control. So um, any of the areas where the water is going in should have a mesh on it. You want to reduce, um, you know, um, uh, reduce um, any pests getting in there. So rodents, um, definitely mosquitoes. And so for rain barrels, you want to set them up in a way and purchase rain barrels that have screening um, and don't have any openings that something like a, a mosquito or a yellow jacket or um, a rodent could get into. Good question. Great. Okay, thank you again, everyone. And I guess we'll close here. Have a great um, rest of your week, everyone. Stay safe and healthy and um, really appreciate your time. Take care. Thank you, we hope to hear from you. Yeah, definitely, thank you.